Welcome to the Demography Conferences. Uh, today, we are happy to welcome uh, Professor Priest at the conference of Fatih Tepe University Institute of Population Studies. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Priest. Uh, he studied social science and graduated from Roy University in Bochum. Um, he received habilitation at Erlangen Nuremberg University. He was a visiting professor in El Colegio de Mexico in the early 90s. Uh, he has been a professor for sociology and holds a chair in sociology of migration, organizations and participation at Roy University in Bochum since 2001. Uh, Professor Priest is also an executive committee member of the European Sociological Association for the 2019 and 21 period. Uh, his research areas concern sociology of work, organizations, migration in a comparative perspective and transnationalism and globalization. And now I leave uh, the floor to Professor Priest to present his study titled Life Course Analysis of Forced Migrants Comparing Turkey and Mexico as Transit Countries. Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'm very happy and feel honored to be part of this uh, course uh, at uh, Hacettepe University. Uh, I don't know personally the, the university, but um, first, it's well known as one of the leading universities in Turkey. And second, uh, we invited a postdoc from Hacettepe University, um, uh, Berna Sylvika Safci, and she's working with me. And I'm very happy that she is doing this job because it's a very complicated research project. Which, which I would like to introduce to you uh, right now. This is funded by the German uh, research funding institution, uh, DFG, the biggest one, and is organized here at Ruhr Universität Bochum. The Ruhr University in Bochum is one of the 10 biggest universities in uh, Germany and um, in sociology. In an extensive uh, research, it ranked as one of the top 10 universities in quality. So I think uh, Hachetepe and uh, Ruhr University have a, a lot in common, not only persons, but also uh, their status in the national scenery. So I would like to invite you, as far as I know, most of you are demographers and um, uh, related and uh, with uh, quantitative methods of data analysis, data gathering. So I would invite you uh, to think of mixed methods approaches for a very outstriking topic to analyze. And this is organized violence and forced migration. This is a topic I think in Turkey very, very important and also in Germany after uh, 2015 with a migration movement from Syria. Mm, this uh, extended a lot uh, in public attention and also in scientific research. So we are currently um, um, in this project uh, called Organized Violence and Forced Migration, a comparison of Mexico and Turkey as to perhaps the most all of the, over the world, the most important transit countries of forced migration. Turkey hosting more or less, I don't know exactly, but uh, almost uh, 4 million uh, refugees from different countries, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, but mainly Syria. Uh, Mexico hosting um, refugees and forced migrants from Central America, but also from uh, Cuba and other Latin American countries, etc. So. What is uh, the, 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 the basis or the reason to study organized violence and forced migration? First of all, I think uh, we have uh, 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 many reasons to study migration and especially forced migration. If we think of the, the last decade from 2010 to 19, world population grew more or less at uh, 11% but international migration at 81%. And even more forced migration increased uh, in 100% doubled. 
So this is why forced migration should be a, a topic on the agenda of our research. Second, if we take uh, the current year 2021, according to UNHCR, we estimate or we can, can estimate some almost 100 million people of concern. Perhaps you know this concept of people of concern of the UNHCR, it's quite complicated, but in any case, it's about 21 million international refugees. It's about uh, 7.3 million returnees as refugees and IDPs. It's about 49 million internally displaced persons that we never see in uh, Germany or in Turkey, but that are, who are displaced mainly in Africa and uh, Central America and nor Northern Latin America, etc. It's about 5 million asylum seekers, 4.4 uh, million stateless persons, and uh, 6.7, uh, 6.5 million other persons of concern. Only in Venezuela, we have some similar numbers of forced migrants, mainly living in Colombia, uh, based uh, and due to the economic but mainly political crisis of uh, Venezuela. So uh, taking uh, the data only from UNHCR, um, it is outstriking that organized violence and forced migration are crucial topics of our research agenda or should be. In our research, we understand organized violence as the use of physical force in legal and illegal forms. It could be states, it could be terrorists, it put, could be criminals. Think of Syria, think of, think of Guatemala, of Honduras or El Salvador, where during the 1960s, we had military dictatorships for instance, uh, or where uh, in nowadays we have uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, organized violence also is uh, defined or understood as perpetrated in a collective continuing and organized way. It's not just, um, uh, just one event in time, but it's a continuous uh, collective uh, action. And it is organized in order to achieve collective and or corporate goals. Think of the Islamic State uh, with a, a terrorist uh, religion program, etc., and other groups. Organized violence always is related to other types of violence, like symbolic and structural violence, namely gender-based, homophobic, race, ethnicity-based persecution. But we tried in our research to have a more uh, strict definition of organized violence some of you could be familiar with the concept of structural violence proposed by Johan Galtung already in the 1960s, but I think this is, goes too far. And the second term of our topic is forced migration. Forced migration as internal uh, and international social spatial mobility and understanding social mobility migration as a collective action, not just as an individual action. This is in many um, migration studies, uh, we take migration as individual decision-making, especially in the econo economies uh, of migration. And I think this is, uh, has a lot of uh, shortfalling um, uh, consequences. Forced migration in our understanding is an iterative and sequential. It's a long lasting and it's a reversible um, process. It's not uh, just one point uh, in time event. Forced migration is mutual um, um, in influenced by migrants and by the sedentary groups. It uh, is uh, important how the Turkish uh, society or people in Turkey, living in Turkey, uh, is facing the situation of the 4 million uh, Syrian uh, migrants. Uh, this um, will have an impact on how they feel received, welcome, or rejected in uh, Turkey. The same holds for Germany, uh, etc. Forced migration also is a multi-local and multi-dimensional um, uh, topic. It's economic, political, social, and cultural uh, aspects. And we have to consider, even if we speak of forced migration, 
that almost all migration all over the world is to a certain extent mixed migration flow as a continuum between voluntary and involuntary migration. Uh, think of the climate debates, earth warming, and the effects on migration movements that will uh, come out during the next uh, decades. So summing up, forced migration is not just a one uh, point in time uh, event, but it is to be considered and conceptualized as a part of life courses of people as actors and as collective actors. This is uh, especially what we want to uh, approach in our research. So this is uh, our uh, the basic um, um, concept. And now what's uh, specific in our research? Taking the side of uh, Syria, Turkey migration, um, we uh, start from this aspect and assumption of looking at forced migration as a trajectory, as a continuum in time, as not just one event in time, but as a process. And this red line uh, should, uh, can, could um, demonstrate or indicate how migration, for instance, from Syria uh, through Turkey uh, towards Europe could be uh, thought of. And I will come uh, to this uh, in a minute. So life, what, what we are interested in is this life course of forced migrants. As demographers, many of you will be familiar with a, a, a life trajectory uh, um, a concept in the sense of sequence of events in time. We take the life course uh, concept, which is uh, well established and developed in the United States, in France, in Germany. We have very substantial research, uh, especially since uh, the 1970s, 1980s. So it's a long-term iterative and collective process of social practices with explicit decisions, but not only with explicit decisions as uh, conceptualized in the rational choice model, for instance, but it's also a process of everyday life, of everyday actions not just a one-time rational decision, and, but it's a, it's a continuous uh, uh, social practice. During the process of migration, there are changes in the time horizon, in the target countries or locales where people want to go, the reasons why they go, the goals and the networks they are moving in, etc., etc. All this is shifting during the process. And so we have to analyze and to capture data of processes, not only data on situations. The types of uh, forced migration could be a, a prolonged displacement or diaspora situation, like for many Syrian uh, migrants in Turkey or even in Germany, perhaps many people uh, feel like in a di diaspora situation. It could be a short transit migration. Many of those who flee from Central America, they want to uh, arrive in the United States. And so Mexico is just a transit country. They try to cross it in one or two weeks, but often they need one or two years. They are rejected from the border, et cetera, et cetera. You know that at this moment, hundreds of thousands of people knock the door and try to enter as undocumented migrants in the United States after the uh, Trump era. Uh, we have very broad scope of relevant actors in forced migration. This is organized violent uh, groups, I already mentioned, state agencies. It's NGOs, it's social networks, it's civil society. All this has to be considered if we try to analyze forced migration dynamics. And for, uh, forced migration has to be embedded in life projects and life strategies of people, of persons, of actors. Finally, borders and barriers, places, territories have to be uh, taken into account as well. All this is so complex that we only focus on two aspects. And this is, I think, uh, interesting in the sense of mixed method, because we understand in this project life course 
as uh, in two different uh, perspectives or dimensions. One is life course as a trajectory. Life course is the sequence of positions and events in time. This is what you as demographers know quite well. If you, uh, if you have a life course analysis, uh, you analyze the sequence of positions and events in time and for instance, measure by uh, box uh, analysis, uh, box plot, um, no, by, by um, different kinds of event analysis, um, how events in the past influence on the events um, afterwards or in the, in the, um, uh, in the present. The second element of life course is bio biography. Life course is not only a trajectory in the sense of sequence of positions, but it's also a subjectively experienced and subjectively remembered, reconstructed flow of social practice and incidents. And only by integrating the trajectory and the biography part of life course, we can get a glimpse of what actually is happening and what people, for instance, will do in the future. This is why we uh, apply these methods. I hope you can uh, read it. First, we have a standardized longitudinal survey, uh, um, surveying 350 people minimum uh, as forced migrants in Mexico and in Turkey. We now have about 800 um, uh, surveys already done in both countries and uh, currently are in the, in the process of analyzing and then of comparing uh, the, the, the data. Second, ethnographic visits to immigrant shelters and organizations. Third, biographical interviews with migrants, minimum 15 in each country. We began with uh, the goal of 30 interviews in each country, but due to uh, Corona, it is very difficult to, to move in these uh, contexts. So we reduce our aims to 15 in each country. And we also will have and already did a lot of semi-structured expert interviews in organizations with politicians, et cetera. And we are analyzing documents in a secondary analysis, uh, especially to, to characterize the governance regimes for migration in Turkey and in Mexico. We have a, a bunch of uh, guiding assumptions for this comparative analysis. I think it's the first time that we have a systematic analysis of this kind between two countries, including this uh, kind of mixed methods approach. I will not go into details, but uh, at least uh, to have a glimpse, we. Uh, take data in the surveys and in the biographical narrations of the context causing the forced migration in the countries of origin. Um, and we have some assumptions that this is the situation is quite different between Mexico and Turkey. Uh, we have assumptions on the duration and the legitimation and the actors of organized violence that influence these uh, processes of forced migration, etc. I will not go into details. Second, we have some basic assumptions on the crucial experiences of uh, uh, forced migrants um, related to organized violence that they experience during their migration trajectory. Because we, uh, our assumption is that the migration experiences of people are not just um, something of the past, but influence the future life course and the future life projects of people. This is crucial. Third, we analyze the contexts of organized violence and of forced migration in the countries of transit. In this case, not only ask for uh, the, the experiences with organized violence in Afghanistan, in Iraq or Syria, but also in Turkey and in Mexico. And finally, the fourth, this is a crucial aspect, I think that is also very much um, um, studied in Turkey, the context of future planning and desired uh, destinations, where want people to uh, go. Uh, the forced migrants are now stuck in, in Turkey, for instance, do they want to go to Europe? Do they want to return and under which conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot based on the 
um, state of the art of literature and studies already done. We have a lot of uh, a large um, scope of uh, assumptions. Now, what is some, now let me just share with you a, a little bit of the methods and some uh, preliminary uh, results of what we found out. I will begin with the biography part, with a qualitative part. Um, since more, than, more or less since uh, 30 years, I am a fan of mixed methods and I uh, do this kind of trajectory or bio and biography um, organ um, related and organized uh, studies. So in the biography part of the project, um, I will only, I will not go into details, but uh, it's, I think it's important to know for you, perhaps you are not as familiar with what is the concept of biographical narration. Biographical narration. If somebody, if I would invite one of uh, um, the audience or of all of you to tell me um, her or his um, life experiences uh, since um, beginning to study at Hachetepe University or here in, in Bochum, um, and I would invite you to just uh, uh, tell me whatever ha happened uh, as important uh, in your life and for your life. Um, I would aim at a one hour or two hours spontaneous narration of you. And this is uh, what we call autobiographical spontaneous narration. And the basic assumption, the theoretical assumption is people will, while narrating their own life history, people will uh, reconstruct themselves and we as researchers will be able to reconstruct in a second analytical level their uh, life experiences in a more or less integrated way so that we uh, can take these biographical narrations as a crucial source of uh, analysis. And there are very sophisticated uh, methods uh, to analyze biographical narrations. I did this since 30 years, as I told you in my second PhD thesis in Germany, you have to pass a, a habilitation thesis in order to be professor. So uh, I, I did um, biographical narrations with Mexican uh, women and men, and also the trajectory uh, sequence um, of um, um, employment. Uh, life course of, of people. So I will not go into deeper de details, but the methods are very sophisticated, I, I mentioned, and we have a, a, a broad, uh, rich um, um, fund of um, methods from the United States, from France, from Germany, Italy, from Mexico. Mexico is very strong in biographical narrations as well. So I only will um, indicate how the, 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 once you make the interviews, once you transcribe, transcribe the interviews, um, which is sometimes 50, 70 pages, uh, how to uh, analyze uh, biographical narrations. And this is what we are doing uh, right now. The first step of is a formal and content analysis of these narrations. And I just mentioned some of uh, the element of these elements in the first step. First, you describe the interview setting relating uh, to the content. So where did the interview take place, et cetera, et cetera. This is very important. It's a kind of ethnographic reflection in order to know uh, and to be able to embed the narration in the specific social situation. Second, we analyze the full narration according to text segments, sentences or paragraphs, according to the type of text. And we distinguish three different types of texts. Uh, texts that narrate events in the past, they, they, they are very nearby the sequence of events, text uh, uh, segments, that are more um, focusing on arguing, on reasoning, 
um, so the sequence of different things or the decision to migrate or um, the, the point where you uh, leave your um, uh, home or you uh, join with a partner, these are often elements in the life course where you argue and reason why you did this or that. And finally, describing, description, simply uh, explain, uh, it's, it's a kind of explanation of, of situations and of arguments, etc. So, and, and we have some uh, signal words and contexts where uh, to, and how to um, identify uh, the text segments according to these different characters. Third point is we arrange uh, the biographical narrations according to thematic blocks and issues narrated. Uh, it, this relates to what we call time order in life course. There is a specific uh, subjective reconstruction of the objective uh, sequence of events. I will come back to this in a minute. Fourth, we differentiate between what we call experienced life course, the life course, how we can uh, reconstruct it as a sequence of uh, socially relevant uh, events in the past uh, based on the narration of uh, the interviewee. And fifth, the narrated life history is the way how uh, the people tell their story. This could differ a lot from the experience life course. I will show you this uh, with, a, with a two examples. Sixth, we compare the experienced and the narrated life course in order to interpret um, discrepancies and also to identify, uh, for instance, what we call turning points in life courses, where people who always were quite self-confident in what they are doing, etc., cetera, um, uh, experience a turning point and feel like fully object of organized violence. Think of a, a Syrian, uh, uh, um, we have some uh, examples of uh, Syrian handcrafts, artisans who working, uh, working in um, um, Aleppo, for instance, and with a fa family happy, and then um, the the, they experience a turning point, a substantial turning point in their life course. So this is identifying turning points in experienced life courses and in narrated life history. This is uh, what we aim at. There are all, uh, further steps, second and third step in this kind of biographical narrations. I will not um, detend in this, but only give uh, two examples. I hope you can at least imagine what's going on in this graph. Here we see this lower uh, blue line is the clock time uh, sequence of events um, reconstructed the events based on the narration of um, Miss Kai. This is an interview that one of our master students, Tabea Rebiger, uh, did with a Syrian refugee, Miss uh, Kay. She's also a student now at our university. So this is the objective, the, the clock time sequence of events based on the narration of this uh, woman. And here we put uh, beginning of the war in Syria, uh, 2010, um, the, the father um, is um, uh, dismissed uh, uh, of his job in uh, Syria, etc. So this is mm, the sequence of crucial events in the life course of this person. And now here we put the minutes, minutes, minutes and seconds of the narrated uh, life course. This is 48 minutes. And in the first six minutes, uh, the person extends about the situation before and until 2010. And then you see how the sequence, when events are mentioned in the narration, more or less coincide or are coherent with this objective sequence of uh, time events uh, or events in the clock time. Yeah? But now only to compare, this is another 
Uh, Mr. M, uh, this is another refugee who arrived in Germany from Syria. And here you see the, the person begins to speak about the last time here when leaving uh, Syria in 2014. So the first uh, third part of uh, his story is quite focused on the last part of his trajectory. And then at the end of the narration, which was one hour and four minutes, at the end of the narration, he begins to refer to the situation before. Yeah. So this was one uh, first step of this interview. It was much uh, more um, complex. There, there was a second sequence of interview. So this is just an example why, and this is my argument, as social scientists, as demographers or sociologists, as economists or politi uh, political scientists, we never ever will understand complex social dynamics only based on one method, being quantitative or qualitative. And we need this kind of research in order to understand the meaning that people attribute to their actions. Uh, many of you perhaps uh, are familiar with the so-called uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas uh, theorem. Uh, William Thomas, one of the fun, uh, founders of the Chicago School of Sociology, and uh, one of the two authors, uh, together with Florian Znaniecki, a Polish uh, soci sociologist, uh, both wrote the first and crucial, uh, until today, very, very uh, relevant uh, study on migration, the Polish peasant in uh, uh, the US, um, 2,500 pages. Until today, it's for me, the one of the most brilliant uh, migration analysis uh, ever we had, uh, even for the situation of uh, my, my people migrating from Turkey to Germany, it, it's uh, very, very important. So uh, William Thomas um, argued the following. If men, if people, if a person defines a situation as real, they are real in their social consequences. This is crucial for me. This is one of my favorite uh, sayings uh, as a sociologist, because we have to understand the perceptions and the interpretations, the meaning that people attribute to specific social situations if we try to explain it. Without this understanding, we never ever will be able to explain. This is exactly what Max Weber uh, defined as um, the need to understand meanings before explaining causing factors. Okay, but this is another debate. Uh, I hope that we will be able to um, go into details. But this is why I think it is so crucial and so important to have not only trajectories of forced migrants, but also biographies or narrations of migrants. Now, this was um, an example or two examples of Syrian refugees in Germany, having arrived in Germany, having their refugee status, studying at our university and um, interviews we analyzed in a so-called research master course. Uh, now we are also did some uh, interviews already. Uh, and here you find uh, two uh, further uh, analysis of biographical narrations, in this case, based on a very, I, I don't know if you are familiar with this,
argues that people in life and in organizations, in a profit organization like a company, in a university, in a, any kind of organization, people have basic, basically three kinds of um, strategies to cope with challenging situations. They could subordinate and uh, follow the logic of loyalty. I will suffer the oppression of democratic rights in my country. Uh, I will suffer our president and all what he is uh, saying about uh, Kurds or uh, uh, German Jews or whatsoever, uh, and will, will not do anything. Loyalty. Second, voice. I will uh, uh, fight against what I think are living conditions that I am not um, ready and willing to accept. Therefore, I will go to action, a polit political contention, voice. And third, exit. Exit is, I will leave this organization I will not go uh, on working in uh, Volkswagen because it's a ugly company with uh, carbon dioxide um, uh, uh, producing cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, exit voice and loyalty are the three basic options of individuals when working in an organization. But also, and this is why we applied it to the. Uh, situation of forced migrants, uh, because these three options also are for um, people thinking and considering to have to leave their country. And so in the biographical narrations of um, Mustafa and Asina, this, these are the two persons, the, the black line and the gray line, uh, they narrate their biographical experience first under the concept of loyalty. They explain how they lived in Syria, accepting a lot of oppression, of control, etc., etc. But then one of them, um, Mustafa, began voicing uh, by protesting, participating in the protests until 2015, more or less. And then he exit. He took the exit option and went uh, to first Iraq, then via Turkey to Germany. So um, exit is uh, something in between voice and loyalty for us. Um, I will not go into details. I hope you understand there is an explicit theoretical conceptual framing, exit, voice, and loyalty, and an established methods and methodology to analyze biographical narrations in order to understand the the, the, the life causes of migrants. I'm coming to the third and um, then last part of my uh, presentation. This is the trajectory part of the project. So on the one hand side, we aim at analyzing our biographical narrations of forced migrants in Turkey and in uh, Mexico uh, based on this conceptual uh, framework. And the second part is analyzing surveys, uh, the data, uh, the survey data, the trajectory part of the project. And here I just have one example of a person, uh, of an interviewed person uh, that went to Germany. And this is the, the kind of reconstruction of uh, trajectories of migration uh, that we uh, are aiming at and working on right now. This person, for instance, is uh, from the um, uh, northern, west, west northern part of Syria, um, Idlib. He first went uh, to the border with uh, Turkey, then returned to Idlib, then uh, he went uh, to Iraq, uh, some from um, some relate, relatives lived in Iraq. He went back to Idlib and then the family decided via Turkey uh, in a quite complicated sequence to go uh, first here to uh, the 
western part of Turkey and then um, coming over to uh, Greece and going for the Balkan route up to uh, uh, first Hem uh, in the northern part and then to uh, Bochum, arriving in Bochum. So this is the trajectory of forced migration of one person in the sense of simply um, a timeline of crucial events in the life course. And we see this is not, forced migration is not a one, one point in time decision making, but it's a very complex and dynamic process that is going on for years and sometimes for years and years. And for instance, uh, with uh, Berna uh, Sulfika, we analyzed uh, the uh, huge uh, survey that was done in Germany with more than 3000 Syrian refugees in a very complex way, capturing uh, their overall life course and especially their migration course. And then we analyze different corridors of migration Syria to uh, Germany directly, Sur Syria via Turkey to, to Germany, Syria via the MENA states here, uh, East, uh, Middle East and Northern Africa. So the people went here by uh, through Italy, etc., and others. So differentiating different migration corridors, we calculated the average time um, of uh, people needed to go. To go, to go and we see this is between one and a half and almost two years uh, for uh, arriving from Syria uh, to Germany. This is why we argue that uh, the life, uh, the, the, the forced migration is a social practice process and not a one point in time uh, decision making. Uh, we also uh, calculated different um, the transportation costs, accommodation costs, uh, costs for escape and smuggling, etc. So this will hopefully uh, appear as a, uh, appear as a paper. We be published as a paper in the future. Now we have some preliminary results um, um, of our survey that we did in Turkey in cooperation with uh, Murat Erdogan. He organized a team of um, interviewers able to speak in Arab uh, language uh, or um, in, even in Pashtun in, in different languages. And we interviewed uh, refugees, forced migrants living in Turkey, having arrived from Afghanistan, Iraq and uh, Syria. And here are some uh, preliminary results. First, what are the very important reasons to leave the country? And we also have the, um, the reasons to select uh, Turkey afterwards, but the, here only the, the reason, the very important, the most important uh, reason for leaving the country. And we see it's a fear of violent conflict or war, fear of forced subscription to military or armed services in Syria, a crucial problem for any men fear of criminality and violence. This is something that is not or must not be directly related to uh, formalized legal wars or illegal, but, but to wars that we know uh, between armies, uh, formal armies, but this could include any kind of, any other kind of organized violence. Poor economic life conditions always are in play. And this is why we speak of mixed migration flows. But anyway, we see a little bit uh, of, uh, as uh, you remember, the first uh, battery of assumptions related to the situation and context when leaving the country. Second point, why did they choose uh, Turkey? And here we see, because it was close to, uh, to my country, to my city, the, the first, uh, the most important uh, answers, because of the secure life conditions in Turkey, because of education system in Turkey, this was quite, uh, for me, astonishing, relevant for people when choosing Turkey. Uh, and because friends, acquaintances, 
live here. This is uh, all the theory of migration networks and migrating in social networks. So this is, um, we had a total of uh, 853 uh, valid responses, multiple responses, uh, so more than 350. And uh, this is uh, the reason, the most important reason to select Turkey. Which are the kinds of violence people experienced uh, before coming to uh, Turkey? Um, and we differentiated, with, or they could um, tick the box, uh, this kind of violence I experienced sometimes, or this kind of violence I experienced quite often. And if we take here the threat of violence, it's uh, the most important is, um, is the threat of violence, not just robbery or retention or financial fraud, or armed attacks, but it's threat of violence. And uh, in, 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 as, as sometimes uh, the most important is robbery and financial fraud. So we try to differentiate uh, the, the very uh, multitude, multitude of ways of experiencing uh, different kinds of violence. Finally, we asked uh, what, what we, 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 we had a lot of questions uh, concerning to the current situation in Turkey. Uh, for me, it seems that violence can happen at every moment in the current situation where I'm living right now. And then differentiating between Afghan people from Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria, it's quite astonishing that uh, the people are very different in perceiving uh, the violence in their current situation in Turkey. Here you see Afghans and Iraqis uh, feel very secure in uh, uh, Turkey as compared to Syrian refugees in Turkey. And um, the, 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 in, uh, based on the Afghans, uh, we have a polarization to a certain extent because a fourth part of them agree with this statement that violence can happen at every moment. So we have a dichotomous um, expression of perceptions as uh, in contrast in, in the Syri case of Syrian refugees, it's quite different. Um, another statement was regarding violence, I could have chosen a better country. Uh, I don't agree is the most frequent answer in the case of Afghans and Iraqis. In the case of Syrians also, it's almost um, 50 percent uh, that uh, don't agree with this, could have chosen a better country, so feel quite comfortable. But we have half of the people uncertain or agreeing with, I could have chosen a better country. I think this is quite interesting and we have to do um, more uh, data analysis uh, because um, this could lead to different consequences for uh, policies in Turkey as well. Another question was, I feel exposed to the arbitrariness of the authorities here in this country. And the same, we feel find some different uh, figures of answering for Afghanistan, Iraqi and Syria uh, rooted people. Um, being the Syrians, with the highest shares of agreeing or being uncertain with this uh, statement. And finally, in this city, for me, there is no need to fear violence, um, strongly disagree. So it's strange, but um, many of the Afghans say related to the very specific situation in their locale, in their city, <clears throat> that um, they, they strongly disagree with the statement that there is no need to fear violence. So this is quite astonishing. Um, 
also, I, I don't understand it uh, quite uh, directly. Here we see for this kind of data interpretation, uh, the biographical narrations could be very, very useful. But anyway, we find these um, um, results quite interesting. The last slide, um, future directions of their lives. Um, in general terms, if you could choose, would you rather go back to your country, stay here, or continue to another country? And then you see, want to go further to Europe, to the USA, almost half of the uh, interviewees, 22% um, uh, want to stay in Turkey, and uh, almost 30% try to return to my country. Um, I know that um, um, Ayan Kaya, uh, Ahmed Ichtigü, and Murat Erdogan and others uh, are doing similar research on, or at least there's um, more research on this question in Turkey. But combining biographical interviews and this kind of survey analysis, I think we will find uh, good um, results for explaining the situation. So my conclusion is forced migration has to be considered not as a one time in life event followed by simple return or simple arrival in a new place, but has to be considered as a complex and long lasting process and as a part of the life course, a sequence of events and as biography, this double sense I mentioned. And violence and organized violence are often underestimated factors because their impacts is not a one time in life event, but also in the same manner has long lasting impacts in life course. We see this in Germany where many, many, uh, almost a third part of the refugees arriving from uh, Syria uh, are traumatized and, and need uh, medical or social psychological help. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Professor Price, Price for your presentation. And uh, we can move to the questions and asks uh, answers part um let me uh see if there is any question uh i guess not and uh, those who wish to ask questions through microphone or through connecting with your camera please write down to chat i am opening the chat right now uh so that i can make the necessary arrangements from zoom and there is one question, I guess. Uh, Professor Priest, can you see as well? Mm, no. Sazan uh, uh says, uh, is try to return my... Uh. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm checking the chat, but in the chat, I don't... Uh, uh, it is in the Q and A part. Ah, Q, uh, okay, okay, okay. You you opened a, a special chat room as Q and A. Okay, and and Murat uh, Erwan also has a question in the chat room. So the first is mm -hmm. um, I try to return my country result disintegrated by nationality. I what what is meant by this question? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, okay, maybe I can um, uh, connect uh, not I, Ardon through. Uh, I think, sorry, I, I think I understood the question um, mm -hmm. um, uh, of Sezen because uh, it's related to the last slide. If I'm, uh, if I'm right, uh, this uh, slide where the general answers of future directions for their lives uh, are uh, given. Uh, and it's uh, cr crucial to differentiate between the countries uh, of uh, origin of these people, nationality, but also ethnic self-ascription, because, for instance, many people we interviewed, we surveyed, 
coming from uh, Syria, um, auto um, or named themselves as Kurds or described themselves as Kurds. And we will analyze uh, correlating uh, uh, effects of between uh, living plans or plans to go further and uh, country of origin and um, ethnic uh, group and educational status, et cetera, et cetera. We still are in process. Thank you for the question. I, I've, I've found, I find Murad Erdogan in the chat. Can, can I ask, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we okay. can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, dear Ludger, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, you here, and then I'm also very happy uh, to be a part of this project. Uh, it is a huge uh, honor for us. And then, as you know, our team is Nihal, Twilin, Zakira. We are all here, and then uh, with the cooperation with uh, Berna. Um, my question was also the, the uh, actually the same one. I mean, the future perspective of the refugees in Turkey. As you know, my Surin Barometer Survey, we are uh, doing a very, uh, yeah, it's a very comprehensive survey. And then we can see also uh, there how, um, uh, how is the situation of the Syrian uh, refugees? It, it is only for the Syrian refugees, by the way. Uh, and uh, what is their future perspective? And then we are asking also the same question. Uh, do we have any interest to go to the third country? And um, each year, we can see more interest than before. It was around 20% now, uh, the, in 2019, it was 30%, now we have 40%. But uh, in which way is also a very important question. Because as you know, we have also another experience last year in our Turkish-Greek border. And uh, it was also a very chaotic uh, time for the refugees, not only for the Syrian, but also the other Afghan, Iraqi refugees, et cetera, et cetera. And then we ask also, especially the question, in which way do you want to go to other country, third country? And uh, very openly, very clearly, they want to go legal uh, to the third country, not illegally, and then not forced, but illegal. Uh, whether they get this uh, opportunity or not, it's uh, also another discussion topic. But one point is for me also sometimes very important. If we ask the ordinary Turkish people, do you have interest to go to third country? Then we will get also similar answers, I think. And because of that, I'm, uh, I have to ask you, how can you make these differences between the refugee society in a country and then host society? And uh, can we find any solution to make a conference between the both societies to have an interest to go to third country? One additional point, from Turkey to Greek island, uh, we have yeah, some people, they try, and they are mostly not Syrians. They are around 15% is Syrians now. The others is the other countries. I think one point would be also very important is the status, status of the refugees in Turkey. If you look at the Syrians in Turkey, they have a status, temporary protection status, okay. But the others, they have also another problems. And how can we describe the situation in this framework? I mean, the violence, and then security, et cetera. That is my question. Uh, sorry, it was a little bit longer. Thank you. Well, should I answer? The, um, well, Murat, thank you very much for these very complicated <laughs> and difficult to answer, questions difficult to answer immediately. Uh, we, we just began with the analysis of the data that you uh, raised in, in Turkey, and I hope that we will be able to share all these um, data analysis in, in, in the future. Um, I think one uh, aspect that I know from other studies as well is uh, the longer people are feeling to be caged in, in a limbo of not legal or not regulated, not 
accountable, not uh, prospecting for the future status, uh, the, the, the higher the uh, propensity that people want to go further to other countries. They don't want to go back uh, if uh, the situation uh, still is like it is now in Syria. And even in Central America, it's, it's quite difficult. It's very different because there it's a much more complicated mix of economic uh, disaster, let's say, and uh, violence that comes from any uh, kind and any corner. So I think the propensity of uh, trying to go further depends a lot on, uh, obviously, on uh, that we found this, on um, personal um, criteria or values, um, variables, uh, like education, age, uh, gender, but also depends on the experiences of and the time period people um, uh, live in a specific situation. In Mexico, it's almost impossible to to have a legal. It's, it's very restricted to have a legal re um, refugee status. So uh, from the very beginning, they are much more decided to go to the United States than the Syrians who arrived in Turkey, I think. Uh, and in Turkey, I don't know exactly, but as far as I know, out of the 3.7 or 3.6 million uh, Syrian forced migrants in Turkey, how many do have um, a legal status, but it's a time limited statute, isn't it? Status, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So this should uh, have an impact on, on their willingness to go further to, the, to Europe uh, as well. Or what, what's, what's your experience? Oh, uh, actually, it's also a really very complicated issue. We have also uh, this experience. Uh, it's a very, very complicated and then very dynamic process. And uh, one more time, I think uh, one of the important points is that the, the status. And of course, we have also new um, development uh, from the European side. Because Turkey is a uh, yeah, so-called a bridge between uh, very unstable unsta uh, countries and then to, to the European countries. And because of the, the interest of the refugees to come to Turkey, uh, is uh, also we cannot explain uh, uh, easily because some of them will stay uh, forever in Turkey, but some of them want to go to the third countries. But I think this violence, organized violence, we should think about that. And then it will be also great if you also explain a little bit, what do you mind uh, with organized violence? Because this violence can come from terrorist organizations or, in, or military arms, et cetera, et cetera. But it could be also coming from a state. Only the status is one of the important issue. If you have no status, then you are open for the organized violence. That's also another issue. And yep. then maybe you can also uh, uh, make some comments uh, about that. Yeah, this is a very, I, I, I fully agree. And for, for instance, uh, in a very rough uh, perspective between Mexico and uh, Turkey, I think uh, people in Turkey, as you uh, already mentioned, um, ha normally have a legal status, even if it is time limited or reduced in rights to work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but they have a certain kind of legal status. In Mexico, it's much more difficult. Uh, the the current and normal situation is that they uh, illegally, irregularly enter the country, Mexico, um, aiming at uh, crossing the country as fast as possible. And e each policeman that detains uh, a refugee from Central America will ask for, let's say, $50 uh, to pay for uh, in order not to be uh, detained. So it's a very, very uh, much more unprotected situation of uh, uh, these migrants in Mexico than in Turkey, at least at, a, at, at the general level. Second, we have a lot of uh, testimonies of those who came 
via the Balkan routes to Germany, for instance, um, studies, quantitative, qualitative studies, where organized violence is not just something that happens in Syria, but that is almost a part of everyday life of the, uh, of the migrants uh, until arriving in Germany. And even in Germany, there could be some violence, let's say, of uh, right-wing uh, politi political groups uh, attacking uh, refugee uh, centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is not as frequent, but uh, also this kind of, of uh, events happen. So uh, I think the policy of uh, the countries where people, the transit country is very uh, crucial and important. And I mean, Turkey is, I think it's in a very complicated situation because from my point of view, uh, the USA and the European Union take uh, Mexico and Turkey as their bodyguards uh, um, controlling and uh, uh, restraining the influx uh, of migrants, refugees. And, and this is why Turkey is in a very complicated, challenging situation. There are questions, oh, sorry. There are a few more questions in the Q&A parts. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Helga Rittersberger. What do you know about uh, the social economic background of the migrants? What about their legal status? Inside? Well, I, the second question, I think we already um, spoke a little bit about in, in terms of the first uh, social economic background. Um, if we refer to our survey, we did not um, um, analyze it very precisely, but we have some guiding assumptions um, in the way that uh, people with a higher uh, level of economic or educational cultural resources, if we take uh, Bourdieu's uh, terms, uh, will be able to flee or to leave a country first or even more easily than those in a more precarious uh, situation. Uh, people, uh, young men will be able to leave uh, a country easier than um, um, uh, women, at least if it's uh, individual migration, uh, forced migration. Um, mm. The family context is crucial, etc. So I think it depends on age, educational level, um, on um, marital status, uh, etc. And we have some indicators, but not the last uh, final analysis until now. The next question, Sinan, uh, is uh, thanks. Uh, why do you think um, you have significant missings, 49 in 350 cases? Is it due to some filters, uh, skips, or people avoid themselves to respond this? Or oh, this is a very specific question related, uh, I think, to the last slide I uh, presented uh, where we had uh, 300 and almost more than 350 valid cases uh, cases and um, 49 missings. Um, I, I couldn't explain the 49 missings at this moment, I have to admit. I don't know if Bjarna uh, could give a better answer or Murat, but um, well, in my, in my uh, experience as analyzing this kind of surveys, we sometimes have this kind of, uh, this degree, this is just, it's, uh, it's a, a seventh percent, no? Five out of 35. Uh, Berna Zulfikar just um, typed an answer to uh, same question. And I think she raised her hand to talk about this, Who? maybe. Barna Zülfikar. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can open your microphone. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for organizing this event today. Uh, Sinan Hocam, uh, we have some option in our response categories. One option is, our, uh, is uh, about don't know. We categorize this don't know 
as missing in our analysis while we are triggering our data. So actually they are not uh, missing. They mentioned themselves that they don't have any idea about the picture. But all these graphs and results are, are preliminary first results. So uh, they are only uh, our first results and they are still in progress. We, we just only wanted to share with these graphs today. I hope it will be an answer for your question. Thank you, Berna, helping me in this in this point. It, it's it's just a preliminary, and it's work in process, and hopefully work in progress. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, to analyze uh, and and afterwards to compare the data from Mexico and Turkey. Uh, there's one question as for the biographies. People can make different interpretations for the same event over time. Uh, so do you think that this situation may have some effect on your inquiry? Uh, inquiry? Yes, uh, Sutai, this is a, a very good question. And um, it is, well, we, we, we ha would have to in, uh, enter the, 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 the dogmatics, let's say, of biographical narrative uh, analysis. And the, the, the very strong assumption is that if you take uh, an auto, uh, uh, um, autobiographical spontaneous narration that is, let's say, 60 minutes or two hours without interruption, so people have the opportunity, the chance to just reconstruct subjectively what they experienced, then this is the assumption mainly made by uh, a German sociologist, uh, Fritz Schütze, uh, who by, uh, actually is uh, the father of our co-director, Stefanie Schütze. So Fritz Schütze holds that this narration has a specific internal and more or less coherent um, figure of reconstructing what was the life of this person. Obviously, and of course, this subjective reconstruction of experiences is very subjective and it is dependent of the situation. It could change two weeks later or in the same day in a different social setting, the, the person could uh, reconstruct her or his own biographical uh, life in a different way. But uh, the basic uh, assumption is Yes, we can take this biographical testimony for analyzing turning points and to identify what we call frames of orientation. For instance, uh, the level or degree of self-efficiency that people experience or express in their narration. What I uh, associate, what we will associate with uh, uh, Albert Hirschman's. Um, uh, exit voice and loyalty, etc. Yeah, but this is uh, it's a, it's a detailed question. I hope you will be able to join one of our workshops that we will organize in the future, and we will go into deeper detail. Helga Rittersberger asked, "What about differences in in terms of gender?" Yeah, I, I spoke a little bit about this, but it's a very crucial point. Obviously, we have um, very different uh, answers in the biographical research. I know. Uh, from and we also did uh, almost 30 biographical uh, interviews with Syrian refugees in Germany and obviously uh, gender has a crucial impact, especially in, in aspects of gender violence or gender uh, related uh, sexual violence, although this is an aspect that is normally is not mentioned. Uh, much of violence is difficult to um, Mm, to um, to measure because most of the refugees or forced migrants are not very uh, happy with and are not um, ready to share their experiences of violence, being it sexual or not sexual violence, but especially the gender violence, gender related violence is difficult. And especially for people with different sexual orientations, uh, this is a, a point that we also have in mind. For instance, uh, homosexual uh, young men uh, from Syria who have uh, 
who, who lived uh, crucial challenges when coming here. And this is something that pops not out uh, at the beginning of an interview, but only after many, many uh, hours of uh, trustful uh, conversations. There's one question of Martin Witzika. Um, I don't know, due to time uh, restrictions, perhaps, we, Martin, we could, uh, on Hirschman's loyalty voice exit theory. Lufus, you have to decide because we could, uh, I don't know when, when the event ends. Um, we, if we can answer all the questions and okay. then maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Martin Wittiger, actually it seems to uh, the two poles of that decision-making model are being mutually entangled. In one graph, we have seen around 30% of refugees intend to return another for the intent to migrate to the EU, US. Uh, I don't know to which this refers to the of their voice and empowerment training. Does the theory say something about the question where is the tipping point to decide for either loyalty or voice? Yeah, this is a good question. We submitted a paper uh, applying uh, the Hirschman um, concept and the, a similar question was put by the reviewers. Uh, so for, for, for us, I think uh, exit is uh, in between um, voice and loyalty. Exit is a kind of negotiation with oneself and with others. If you uh, 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 will go uh, towards voice or uh, towards loyalty in the future. Exit by definition has a component of a voice as it is not just accepting and suffering the conditions one is living in. But it's, uh, on the other hand, um, it's not, a, it must not uh, express an active uh, effort to change the situation. So, yeah, the question is interesting. Um, there is question of uh, ignoring sign. Uh, of? Wondering about. Ikno Ruxal, Biographic Narrations. Uh, she asks, did you meet interviewees who have experience in human trafficking? And also, can you give some clues about the integration of qualitative and quantitative research as an important part of mixed methods research? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, at, well, I, at, at this moment, I would rely uh, on the um, interview, biographical interviews we did with Syrian refugees in Germany, the 30 interviews, and also um, a, a study um, analyzing 150, not uh, strictly biographical narrations, but qualitative long interviews with uh, Syrian refugees in Germany. So there's a lot of empirical evidence. and. Um, um, smuggling, at least smuggling, always or uh, in most cases was in place, but not human uh, trafficking in the strong sense of uh, being uh, transported uh, to another country. Like, like, for instance, we have this kind of human trafficking of young uh, women from Romania and Bulgaria uh, towards uh, Germany. This is different. So human trafficking is not as often or very seldom, we didn't almost find it, but a, a smuggling in the sense of uh, services of uh, smuggling organizations or networks, this is very frequent. Um, can you give some clues about the integration of quality, quality research as an important part of it? Yeah, this is a good question and we are still in process. I could, share with you experiences we made um, in, in other research where we successfully integrated both our elements. But for instance, you saw um, now the last slide I presented where uh, the question um, 
of the future plans? Would you like to stay here to continue to another country or to go back to your country? If you only have such a um, survey information, it's very difficult to um, contextualize and embed the findings in the more complex living conditions and interpretation of the current and uh, um, um, past and future uh, situation of the people. So I think uh, we will, um, and still we are preparing the biographical narratives in uh, Turkey. For Mexico, we already have a lot of, uh, at least 10, almost 10 biographical narratives. Uh, so we relate this in order to explain what this final quantitative data I presented, how we could understand and interpret it. And the other way around, the biographical interviews normally will uh, offer you uh, a lot of new hypotheses that you then can check and test with the quantitative data. Olumur uh, Chavlin was uh, um, did raise her hand before. I'm not sure she uh, still yes. has a question, but I will uh, use a love to talk feature. Uh, in the meantime, yes. ah, sorry, yes. there's there's one question of Sina no um, about Greece. I don't know if it's still valid. The last question in the question and answer. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's still valid. Okay, so what do you think about Greece's latest decision okay. on considering Turkey uh, as a safe country for asylum seekers from Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Somalia? How this uh, would affect the future? Um, well, this is a very complex uh, question. And I mean, at the moment when Greece would declare Turkey as a not safe country, um, Greece would not be able to legalize or to legitimize all the pushbacks they are uh, practicing right now. So I think it's, it's, it's a part of a very pragmatic and to a certain extent, obviously dirty, um, or at least not very well empirically based um, declaration uh, to, to take Turkey as a safe country because you know that Turkey did not sign, for instance, the Geneva Conference as valid for other than uh, European uh, countries of origin of refugees. So the, I think there are a lot of um, deficiencies in, or, or problems, challenges that in, in, in the, that the European Union is uh, criticizing all over the world. And we accept these uh, challenges and this complicated situation in order not to be responsible ourselves as European Union and Greece as a part of the European Union. The same holds for Spain when, when uh, the European Union is happy that Spain is doing the dirty work of uh, retaining people from Africa uh, coming uh, through Morocco. Um, I think this is what I called uh, organized non-responsibility of the member states of the European Union, even Germany included, but uh, especially Hungary, Poland, take other countries. So I think it's a very complex question and it's a very important question. I, it's, it's difficult to answer. I'm, I would not be a fan of, uh, of this uh, legitimation of the Greece policy of um, reforging their border control. I guess uh, that's all. Uh, Alona Chowlin wrote, uh, she got answer for her question uh, before. So uh, if there is uh, anything else, and I guess not. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Professor Priest. It was an honor to host you in here. And this was our last um, conference for this semester. We will continue in September and stay tuned. <laughs> I would like to thank you to professor as well. Uh, dear professor, thank you so much for sharing your time and experiences with us. 
I know what goes into preparing such a well-planned conference of this quality. So we are grateful for the time and efforts you took uh, to share your research, your preliminary findings. It was very stimulating. Uh, you gave us a close look at the issue. I'm excited about the final results now on myself and uh, on behalf of my institute, please accept my sincere appreciation for the outstanding presentation you made. Thank you again for your contrib contribution. And I hope to meet in a real life medium in the future. Mm -hmm. This pandemic will end one day and uh, we will remember the meeting uh, meetings that we are used to. So of course, uh, the internet has been very functional during this period. The pandemic gave us this opportunity. However, uh, the taste of the other is different. Face-to-face -face is important. Uh, nothing replaces it. And I hope one day we will meet face-to-face. <laughs> -face. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I very much uh, estimate the Turkish meal. So, and I was in Ankara. So I ho do hope that we could meet once in, in, in life face-to-face. Uh, -face. And, so. uh, and congratulations to the high level of your students. Uh, uh, you see Berna Silvika is very good working in here in Germany. And I hope we can strengthen our cooperation in, in, in the future.